Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. God's good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Therefore, we thank him, we give him glory, and we give him honor for this, another opportunity to come to you uh, this evening, this Wednesday evening, our Bible study hour, we call the Word Alive. And we thank God for keeping us and allowing us through this day to this evening where we can again uh, perhaps share with you the Word of God, encourage you along the way, along your walk, and most of all that we'll bless Him because He's been so good and He has been so kind. Through it all, He's kept us. Through it all, He has blessed us. And for that, we give Him praise and we honor His name tonight. Bow with me, if you would, in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you now for your grace, your mercy, which uh, is always sufficient. We thank you for your provision, God. We thank you that we have. And uh, we thank you, God, for your protection as you watch over us and you keep us, God. And we thank you that through it all, God, our, our minds are still sound. Through it all, God, we, have, have, we still have hope in you. We still are encouraged in you. Through it all, God, we can say that uh, you've been everything that we need you to be. And we bless you for that tonight. So I pray for somebody who is uh, in a difficult situation, more difficult than we can even imagine. I pray that they look up tonight. I pray for those, oh God, whose minds need to be uh, channeled towards you tonight, that they look up tonight. God, I pray for those who uh, need emotional stability tonight. I pray, God, that they will look up to you tonight, for you are the one who our help comes from. Help somebody to remember and see that you are God and you never fail. We praise you. We bless you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good to be back tonight with you. Um, we want to continue in looking at uh, the issues of life and uh, how God wants us to do life. As we said earlier, we know that uh, there's things going on around us, and um, if we're not careful, they can inundate us. So we want to, uh, for our Wednesday evenings together, we're not going to focus so much on what's going around us, but perhaps some things God wants to do with us um, to his glory, as a matter of fact, during these times. And so tonight I want to, uh, I want to see if I can start this way. Uh, there was a, a newscast not too long ago, uh, a guy who had been shopping in the store and he came out of the store and there were some news people who were there in the parking lot. And so the uh, reporter walked over to the guy and uh, the guy was uh, loading his groceries in the back of his car. And the guy walked up to him and he said, tell him, tell me, sir, uh, how are you doing with all these changes and these things that we have in life right now? And the guy's comment was, I feel like I've lost half my life. He said, I feel like I've lost half my life. And I understood what he was saying. He was saying that there's some things that he's been cut off from. He felt it was half of his life, things that he was cut off from that he was no longer able to do because of the situation that we're in, still in right now. And as I thought about that, uh, I thought about that God has done this uh, in our lives. And we talked about this before, the situation that we are. There's been some disconnect. There's been some things We've been disconnected from. Again, we, we can't do business as usual because of uh, what's happening with us right now. So there's really been uh, a disconnect in some of our activities. And I'm going to put this right up here in front, that some of the things that God has disconnected us from, uh, hopefully when this thing is over, we will not go back to those things. In other, in other words, there's some things that God has moved out of our lives now that we can't do and really we shouldn't have been doing in the first place. So with this, where we are now, when this thing is over, some of these things that God has disconnected us from, we ought not try to get connected back to them, okay? But anyway, I, I want to talk tonight, if you would, about um, disconnected to be reconnected. Disconnected to be reconnected. And in other words, with this disconnect that God has caused, I believe that he's also looking for many of us, most of us, what I call a a reconnect, okay? Disconnected to be reconnected. And I want to 
I want to use a passage that many of us are aware of. We've heard before is, is the uh, passage in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah gives us some insight on, on his life and some things that happened with him and God. And um, it says, uh, let me just go into it. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 says, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, disconnected to be get, to get a reconnect. Um, reconnect by directing your focus from the horizontal to the vertical. Reconnect. When there's a disconnect, the reconnect needs to be a, a changing of focus. Listen to this from the horizontal to the vertical. The man in the parking lot said, I feel like half my life has been cut off. He was looking at life in the horizontal. But I believe during this time that God's calling us in this disconnect things that we have happened in the horizontal. He's calling for us to change our focus and make it more vertical, if you would, than horizontal. Listen to what he says. When Uzziah died, Uzziah, uh, by most accounts, was a, was a good king. He was a king who uh, implemented a lot of changes in the kingdom to get people back to God. He was, he was serious about God. He was one of uh, Judah's greatest leaders. Uh, but the problem was, at some point, he got beside himself and uh, Isaiah decided that he was going to go in and make offerings to the Lord, which only the priests were supposed to do. So when he went in to make offerings to the Lord that only the priests were supposed to do, in 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21, if you need a reference, 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21, God struck him with leprosy. In other words, if you would, uh, Isaiah got out of his lane. And when he got out of his lane, he was somewhere he should not be doing what he should not be doing. Uh, God struck him with leprosy and he was put away. He was put in what's called a separate house for the rest of his life. Uh, but he was a good king. And so Isaiah, it said that Isaiah and King Uzziah had a good relationship. Isaiah, it was some have said he probably was a counselor to Uzziah when other kings and other important people came to Uzziah. Isaiah was there hanging out. He was probably at the banquets that um, Uzziah had thrown. He ate with the king and he counseled to the king. So in the horizontal, uh, Isaiah had a connection with Uzziah. Isaiah, Isaiah had a connection with Uzziah in the horizontal. But here it says that when King Uzziah died, there was a shifting of Isaiah's focus. He says when Uzziah died, in the year he died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and, his, and the sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Watch this. Because of the relationship that Isaiah had with Uzziah, it was horizontal. Uzziah was an earthly king. Uh, he had a relationship with the earthly king. But Isaiah says when Uzziah died, he had a focus shift. He had a focus change. When Uzziah, Uzziah, the earthly king died, Isaiah said that he had a focus shift from the horizontal to the vertical. He says, when Uzziah died, he saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled, filled the temple. So he got a, listen to this, he got a focus shift. What happened? His focus shifted from the earthly king to the heavenly king. His focus shifted from the earthly king, listen to that, to this, that had limited power to the holy king, God the king, who had unlimited power. Why do you say that? Because in the text, he said that when he saw God, when he got this vision of God, he was high and lifted up. He says that God's train fill the temple. Now, in those days, oft times the length, the length of a king's train for his robe, that which uh, fell behind him, the length of the train was an illustration of how much power the king had. The longer the train that came off of his robe, it was said the more power he had, okay? And, and Uzziah's 
uh, in the in the in the horizontal with Uzziah, Uzziah was a king. He would have had a train. But listen to this: when he saw the train of God, he said that it filled the temple. The train of God filled the temple. In other words, he could not find a ending. An ending. I'm sorry, bad English. He could not find an ending to God's train, which meant that God's train was not limited. There is no limit to God's power. God is, is unlimited. God is what we call infinite. He is called what we call infinite. He is, there's no ending to him. There, there, there's nothing that could hold him or bind him. So when he said he looked up and he saw God high lifted up and his train lit, uh, filled the temple, that meant that he could see no ending to the power of God. So look at this. When he looked up, his focus shifted from the horizontal to the vertical. He had been buddies with the horizontal king, Uzziah. Now he looks up, shift the focus, and he sees the divine king God. He had been, uh, he had seen the earthly king who had limitations. And now he sees the heavenly king, God, the heavenly king who has, God has no limitation. So there is a shifting of focus. And I want to, I want to present to you, I want to propose to you that uh, during this time of disconnect, during this time, uh, which there's some things that we can't do. We've talked about this earlier. There's some things you can't do, some places you can't go in the horizontal. I want to suggest to you that all of us uh, need to shift our focus to the vertical. In other words, listen to this. There are things that we did in the horizontal. There were the things that even some things we depended on in the horizontal. And God has caused, if you would, a disconnect from many of those things because he wants us to shift our focus from the horizontal to the vertical. When King Uzziah died, Isaiah had a focus change. He had a, a, a different view change. He started looking up where he was always looking around. And it could have been, it could have been that Isaiah had become dependent on Uzziah because of the relationship that he had. And God moved that dependence out of the way. And when he moved that dependence, Isaiah had no choice but to look up. So I'm suggesting to somebody this evening that perhaps during this time of this, uh, he's disconnecting you from some things because you become too dependent on those things. And God wants you to get a fresh new view of life and he wants you to see him. So he's shifting your focus from the horizontal to the vertical. So, so he gets this, this shift of, he gets this shift of focus here, if you would. So now he's got to look up. So let's, let, let's see what's going on here in this, this disconnect so there could be a reconnect or some of us a connect. Uh, what happens here when Isaiah looks up and he sees the king, God, uh, sitting on his throne, high and lifted up? He says in verse 2, uh, Above it stood seraphim. Each one has six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let me just stop there for a minute. Let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, when he gives this shift of focus from the horizontal to the vertical, he sees in, in heaven, he sees this worship scene going on, if you would. He sees these seraphims there, and one cries out to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, this, this phrase here, holy, 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 is what's called a superlative because it's repeated three times. Uh, first, first, recognize that God, it by his His basic characteristic, his foundational characteristic is that he is holy. God is holy. He does everything out of his holiness. He's separate from his creation, yet he cares about his creation. He's holy. God is 
if you would, set apart. If you remember uh, when Jesus taught the disciples the prayer in uh, Matthew chapter 6, he said, when you pray, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed, hallow, hallowed, or holy is your name. So even in prayer, we recognize that the name of God is holy, is, is separate, is different from, he's different from everybody else. He's, he's God. Mama and them used to say he's God all by himself. He don't need nobody else. But the seraphim here are crying out and saying, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth puts God on display. So this is what I call a, a, a vision of worship, a vision of, of worship, a vision of, of worship. Um, one of the things we need to do in this time when God is redirecting our focus is we need to spend time in worship. Listen, we need to spend time in spend time in worship. I'll say a little bit about that more in a minute, okay? But the, ser the seraphim here says, holy, holy, holy um, is the Lord of hosts, the superlative. The whole earth is full of his glory. He says, and the doorposts, the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. Smoke was often used to represent the presence of God. But would you please notice what's happening here? There is worship going on. Holy, when we talk about God being heard holy, that's about that's about worship. And it says here, the whole earth is full of his glory. Listen to this, listen to this. In Psalm 19 and one, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Listen, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. That is his creative power. So, so look at what you got, if you would, in, in the situation here. In Isaiah, we have the whole earth full of his glory. Um, in, in Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens declare of the glory of God. What are the heavens? What is the earth? That's his creation. God's creation put his glory on display. In other words, uh, when you look at creation, you see God. You see the power of God. You see the display of his power. And if you remember back in Genesis, it said when God set out to create, he just spoke the word. In other words, God just said, let there be. And whatever he said, let there be, there was. That's how creation came about. So that's the power of God in creation. So when you want to see God's power, all you got to do is look at creation, look at the stars, look at the sun, look at the, the moon, look at the earth, look at the mountains, look at, look at how he created. He created his created power shows up. His created power shows up in his creation and his creation gives him glory, worship, put him on, put him on display. Now we talked about this a little bit, I think in our last time out about uh, worshiping God. We'll move the, the middle. I'm going to say this in a minute, but God, God's power, if you would, ought to be put on display in our lives. Worship God, worship God. Listen to this. So, so we see then this, this vision that Isaiah gets of the cherubim, seraphim. I keep saying cherubim because that's the uh, new King. I'm sorry, the King James. I'm reading new, new King James here. So y'all forgive me if I if I cross them up anyway, but the seraphim are worshiping him. They are worshiping him. And Isaiah looks up and he sees this worship. So one of the things that we need to do during this time of reconnecting, listen to this, we need to worship God. Let me talk about that a little bit more. Worship should be important in your life. Let, let, me, let me give you just a, a synopsis of this. When Jesus was talking about worship uh, with the woman at the well, over in John chapter four, uh, Jesus is talking to the woman and uh, he, he's talking to her about uh, um, uh, th the things of life and talking about the water and everything. And so he gets to a point where he wants to deal with her and her sin. And he says to her, go call your husband. And she says to him, I don't have a husband. And he says, that you spoken right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. I believe it was five. I didn't look it back at y'all. can correct me if I'm wrong. It was five. And the one you were with now is not your husband. 
when Jesus wants to talk to her about her sin and listen to this, her living condition, she wants to talk religion. In other words, she don't want to talk about her living condition. She wants to start, she wants to bring up an old debate that the Samaritans and the Jews had. She said, uh, you say that worship should be in the temple. And our fathers say that worship should be on the mountain. In other words, she wants to have a debate on where worship is supposed to take place. She don't want to talk about her sin. She wants to talk about style and where worship was supposed to take place. So Jesus says to her in that conversation, he says, woman, verse 21 of 4 John, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you were neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Listen to this now, listen to this now. She was talking about worshiping in a location and Jesus was saying that when you worship, it's not going to be about the, lo about the location, not in the mountain, nor, nor if you would, in Jerusalem, worship the Father. He goes on to say, uh, you worship what you don't know for salvation of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, listen to this, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Listen to what he says. The woman says, it's the place. Jesus says, no, it's the attitude. It's about your internal person. Worship God in spirit. That's your sp Now, that does not say in the spirit. It says here, in spirit and in truth. He says, God is looking, God is, is requiring, God is looking for worship, but God is not looking for worship just in a place. God is looking for worship that's going to come out of your inner person. Worship. Listen, unfortunately, I probably said this before and I'll say it again because you know a lot of stuff gets repeated. Unfortunately, what many of us have done is we have located the worship of God to a place in a certain time of the week, okay? And we can't get to that place. We still got the time of the week, but we can't get to that place. Most of us have concluded worship in the church house, the church house. When, and I probably said this before, when the, the praise leader, the worship leader gets up and does praise and worship and says, come on, let's worship God. And so what we've done is we've concluded worship is to be in a place at a certain time. Jesus said, worship is not about the place. You see, uh, if really it should have been, if he was good enough for you to worship him in his house, he should be good enough for you to worship him in your house. But no, but notice, please notice, Jesus said, it's not about the place. The worship is not about the place. You, he, he really, you can worship God. You can worship God anywhere at any time because worshiping is recognizing God as who he is. He is awesome. He is mighty. He is great. He is holy, holy, holy. There, there is none like him nowhere. Mama used to say he's God all by himself. He don't, he don't need nobody else. So worship was never about the place. They made about the place, and there was a time, listen to this, there was a time when the, when the presence of God was said to be uh, in the temple or in the tabernacle. But if you remember, when Abraham was traveling through the land, Abraham didn't have a tabernacle or a temple, but Abraham stopped going through the land, and it said that he built an altar and he worshiped God. Later on, Jacob, when he was traveling on this journey, and when he was going out and coming back in, Jacob didn't have a temple. Jacob didn't have a tabernacle, but it said that Jacob was traveling. He went to sleep. The, uh, the, the, he had a vision of God, and we call it Jacob's ladder. There were angels descending and ascending on the ladder, and Jacob woke up and said, I did not know God is in this place, and he built an altar, and he worshiped him. Neither one of them had a temper, temple. Neither one of them had a tabernacle, but you know what? When they were awed by the presence of God, you know what they did? They 
worshiped him. So worship is not so much about the place. It's about a disposition of your heart. It's about the your mind and then your spirit person recognizing how great God is and how awesome God is and you worshiping him. And I need to say this to us. In this time of the disconnect, we need to reconnect with God through worship. Some of that extra time you got, don't just spend it doing anything. Get get by yourself, if you would, and just worship him. Get by yourself and just declare his glory. Get by yourself and just declare, God, you are holy, holy, holy. You are creator, God. You are mighty, God. You are awesome, God. We need to take some time to worship God. And I probably will say this. I probably will say this. Um, it could be, it might be in the, in the, in the disconnect. If we would, we would learn now to worship God anyhow, when he allows us to get back to his house, worship will flow easier in his house because we've been doing it in in our house. So in this disconnect time, some of this stuff that you can't do now that you were doing before, and like I said earlier, some of that stuff you were doing before we shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Don't go back to that stuff. Learn to worship him now. And when you when 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 stuff is let up a little bit and we start moving around a little bit more, make sure that you keep on worshiping God because at the seraph, the, the seraphim said, God is holy, holy, holy. Just look around at his creation and that's enough to cause you to, to worship, to worship God. So, um, so worship God. Now reconnect by spending time in worship. The, the disconnect for the reconnect. We need to reconnect by by worshiping God, worshiping God. Worship ought to be something that's important to you. It's important to God. Worship ought to be something that is important to you. So let's, let's see what happens here. Um, Isaiah gets the vision of God. He sees the, the worship going on um, at the throne of God, and he hears the, 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 the seraph, seraphim crying out to the other, holy, 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 uh, it's the Lord of hosts. And then we get to uh, verses five through seven here. We get to five through seven. And I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this up front. I'm going to give you this one up front, okay? Y'all would like to take notes. We're going to give you this up front. Uh, verse five through seven. Reconnect through confession and repentance. Reconnect during this time of disconnect in the horizontal. Reconnect in the vertical through confession and and repentance, confession and repentance, okay? Verse five, verse five. So I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me for I am undone. Listen, let me, let me put this in. Let me put this in before I go any further. There is this thing there is this thing we need, we need to understand. In worship, not only do we see God, but in worship, we should see ourselves. In other words, in worship, we behold and we proclaim the greatness of God, but we should also see and understand our inadequacies. When you, when you, when you begin to really see God and understand God, how great and awesome and mighty he is, you also understand how inadequate you are. You, I understand how inadequate I am. I understand my inadequacy better, uh, more, I should say, when I worship God. But notice here what Isaiah does in the text. Not only does Isaiah see his inadequacies, he says, I, I, am, I am undone. And he says here, because I am a man of unclean, unclean lips. Here's a confession here. He, he said, when I, I got this view of God and I looked at myself, not only did he see his inadequacies, but he saw his sin. When he saw God, when he got a, a view of God in the vertical, he saw himself and he saw his sin and he said, I am a man of unclean 
lips. I, I can't go no further than that. I can't move away from that too fast. Um, le let's see. Let's see. Let's see. F first of all, first of all, we understand this from, from Jesus taught. Jesus taught this. In Matthew uh, 12 and 34, he said, Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay. Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the inner person, the mouth speaks. So, so listen, when Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips, he didn't, he didn't have it the way we have it. The issue for Isaiah and the issue for us is that our lips are regulated by our heart. In other words, what comes out of our mouths, listen to this, what comes out of our mouths is simply indicating what's going on on the inside of us. Our lips are regulated by our inner person. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips, but Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, he says, he says, he says that uh, my lips are unclean, so my heart ain't right. <laughs> he didn't have it like we got it today. So let's admit it. Let's admit it. When stuff comes out of our mouth, our heart ain't right. It becomes it, it comes out of the abundance of our heart. So, um, Lord, it just ain't right. Come on, we need to confess. Isaiah confessed that it just ain't right. Whatever comes out of us, our mouths, is uh, 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 indicative of what's going on in us. And if it don't come out right, if it comes out unclean, it's because we have an unclean thoughts. We got unclean things going on, on, on the inside, unclean, defiled. Listen to this, not wholesome before God. That which is not, is, is defi unclean, is defiled, is not wholesome, is not, listen, is not right is not right before God. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Um, Ephesians 4, 29. Let me give you this one. Let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That, that word corrupt there is an interesting word. Because the root of that word is uh, from what we, uh, we get our English word putrid, putrid, P-U-T-R-I-D. Now, some of you uh, may be familiar with that word. Basically, it means it stinks, okay? Um, it stinks, and many times it stinks because of decay. Uh, perhaps you've had the, um, the unpleasant experience of um, leaving something in the refrigerator too long. Or you put something in the trash can and you didn't take the trash out, the garbage can out there in the kitchen, and you didn't take it out for a while. You open the refrigerator door and because whatever that was that you left in there too long, it decayed, it was stinking. And you said, you said, oh, something in here stinks. Uh, my wife often says to me, um, uh, something will get in the garbage can. And she will go to put some trash in a garbage can in the kitchen. And she'll say, something in there stinks. That means it has decayed. It's become putrid. Putrid things, putrid stuff, it, it decays. It, it, uh, it, it stinks. It's, it's offensive. When something stinks, it offends you. You, you want to hold your nose. You, you want to turn your face. You say, oh, what is, what, what is that? Because it because it stinks, it's, it, because it has decayed. Now, listen to this. In the, uh, so he says, don't let any words come out of your mouth. Listen to this. That will cause decay in somebody else's life. Don't let any words come out of your mouth that stink and will cause decay in somebody else's life. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. The New Living Translation uh, in Ephesians 4 and 29 says, uh, this this phrase corrupt word calls it filthy language that that will get us closer to where we are today filthy language it says let no filthy language come out of your mouth now remember what's coming out of your mouth is part of what's in you filthy let no filthy language 
come out of your mouth, but what is necessary for edification, building up that it may impart grace to the hearer. So, so this is, this is one of the things in confession, and you might need to do this. And every time we, any, any of us, we do this, we need to confess this to God. Uh, okay. Let me, I, how am I going to say, it? um, okay. Uh, there, there are words that we use and there are words that we use that we should not be using because they are this filthy language. Okay. It's, it's just, it's demeaning. It's, um, it, it, it cuts people down, uh, calling people out of their name, um, all kinds of stuff. Some of it is slang words, but it's by in its core is filthy language. It's coming out of your mouth. It's, and I have to be careful that it'll come out of my mouth. Okay, let me, God don't have cussing Christians. Gonna turn me off. God has not anointed or ordain cussing Christians, cussing disciples, disciples that use words to tear people down to 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 um to destroy people's character, the, uh, something wrong with them, and we and we call it out and we use it in a in a put down way. God has not anointed you, neither has He called you to use filthy language, and especially towards other people. Some people use filthy language to show they're mad. Some people use filthy language to prove their point. Whatever it might be, God has not called you to that. Now I'm spending time on this because in the context of the text, Isaiah said I had unclean lips. Unclean lips was stuff that was coming out of his mouth that was not ordained by God. And we've got to stop this stuff, putting out stuff out of our mouths that are not ordained by God. That's why you need to get a reconnect. You need to confess that your mouth has not built people up, but your mouth has torn folk down. Torn folk down. Filthy language, filthy language, filthy language out of your mouth, tearing folk down. That's not what God has called us to do. So there needs to be confess. Now you might need to confess something else. I'm just using the text. There's other stuff we're doing with that in this time of disconnect, uh, so we can get a reconnect. There's other stuff we're doing too. But I just want to stay with the text for now. I don't want to go further than the text because we could go into a whole bunch of other stuff that we as believers are, are, are flirting with, and and all those other stuff that we're doing that are not God. Like this is a time for uh, uh, reconnecting to God. As a matter of fact, you could, you could call this is the time for personal revival, personal revival in worship, uh, personal revival in worship and proclaiming who God is in personal revival and repentance. We need to confess our sin. Watch this now. I'm not through with that yet, but I got to get to here, okay? Uh, he, says, he says here, he says here, oh God, he says here that uh, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, here's the answer to that. We need to, con we need to confess Confess. We need to confess and say, I'm a man of unclean lips. But here is the thing in the text. Here is the thing in the text. Don't miss this. After he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, then he says, I, I do. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, when you confess your sin, I'm sorry, let me slow down. When you confess your sin, be specific about it. Okay, be specific. Don't say, Oh, God, I messed up. God, I sinned. No, I made a mistake. I sinned. Okay, be specific. It's, uh, be specific when we do it. Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. But here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Um, then he says, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. I'm in a society that uses filthy language. I'm in a society with unclean lips. So you know what that means? That means for us that I blended in with those around me. I talk the way I talk, people around me talk that way, and I blend it in. I'm, I'm in a society of people in unclean lips. And so what does that mean? That means that oftentimes what we have done is we have taken on, if you would, what society is doing, and we're not being salt and light. We are blending in. The society has filthy language. I use filthy language. The society cuts people down. I cut people down. The society talks bad about folk. I talk bad about folk. So what we've done is we have acted like the society that God has called us to be salt and light to. Unclean lips. I often, um, um, okay, let, I, let, I don't want this to get me in trouble here. Um, don't turn it off. Um, 
I, I say a deliverance off time. I say there's a deliverance off time. So deliverance, you've heard this before. Um, be careful what you post on social media. N number one, be careful what you post. Number two, be careful what you repost. Some of the stuff that we have posted, I'm talking about believers, those who say we know Jesus, that believers have posted on social media is filled with filthy language. Some of the folks, some of the stuff, I'm not talking about everybody, but some that uh, have posted stuff on social media, they reposted it and it's, and it's full of filthy language. And, and, it's, and, it, and what it does, can we talk, what it does, it just shows that we are blending in with society. We don't read it. We think it's funny, whatever it is, and we, we post it or we repost it and we go on about our business not thinking that people look at what you post. Listen to this. They look at what you post and they see the same language that the world is using and therefore they don't see nothing different in you than in the world because with your language, I'm sorry, with our language, I'm not condemning, I'm just talking, with our language, language we have blended into the world. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people, my society uses that language and I'm just using the language of the society that I'm dwelling in. So there's got to be a reconnect here. There's got to be a reconnect here with, with the words out of our mouth. We, we've, got to, we've got to confess what's coming out of our mouth. We've got to be more concerned and we've got to be more, we've got to be more careful on what comes out of our mouth. Most of all, we need to ask God to really help us we need help because we really need to consider what we're going to say before we say it. If it don't fit with what God would say, we should not say it. God would never call anybody out of their name. God would, would never put anybody down the way society today puts folk down. If God wouldn't do it, guess what? We all not do it either. So part of the reconnect with God is we need to confess, we need to repent of how we've been using our mouths. We need, we need to confess that. And call it what it is. You call it a slip of the tongue. No, it was really in your heart. Confess what it is. He said, I, I blend it in with society. He says, I, I live amongst the people, uh, miss the people with unclean lips. Then he says, the reason I can see myself in in in, in, in the rest, moving on a little further, farther than five, he says, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Remember what I told you earlier? When you see God, you see yourself. And when you see yourself, you, you recognize that you are bare before God because God sees everything about you. Nothing is hidden from him. He sees everything about you. And Isaiah said, when I saw God, I saw myself. And when I saw myself, I found out I was a mess and I was way off base. I was way out of line. My lips were unclean. But listen to this. At least he confessed. At least he didn't go into denial. He said, this is what I have. I have done. Now watch. Now watch what happens here. Watch what happens here. Uh, it says that when he confessed uh, in verse, verse, uh, he said, was me uh, because of a man of unclean lips. Um, and he says, uh, going on, he says uh, that I dwell among a people with unclean lips. And then look at this. Listen, I like to call this after the confession comes the cleansing. This is what I like to call this, okay? After the confession comes the cleansing, okay? Watch this, watch this. Um, verse six says, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purge. When you look at that, look at God, look at God, look at God, look at God in this, in this reconnecting God, look at God. When he confessed it, the seraphim went and got a hot coal and in his vision that he had, it comes and take, touches his lips. Why? Because he said, I am a man of unclean lips. 
So the, the coals then were, 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 were touching the problems. Your lips are unclean. Let me, I'll touch your lips. And he says, when it touches his lips, the angel, if you would, pronounces that your iniquity is taken away. Your sins are purged. Now listen, your sin is purged. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Uh, we said earlier, we said earlier that we understand that Isaiah's lips were a, if you were, okay, let me put it this way. Isaiah's lips were the tip of the iceberg because the, the, the root of the problem, the issue of the problem was his heart, his inner man. So let, let's understand this in the inner man, that really what happens here, if we, we can go forward and come back, that when he touched his lips, the coals represented cleaning his lips, but really he needed his inner man touch. Listen to this. You need your inner man touch. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So listen, Jesus gave us this. The Bible gives us this as believers. It says in 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us and cleanse us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So watch this. I would say, I would say, listen, for our understanding is this, that the touching of the lips of Isaiah with the hot coals was symbolic of Jesus touching our hearts with his blood. Okay, the touching of the lips of Isaiah with the hot coals was symbolic of Jesus touching our hearts with his blood. The angel, the seraphim declared that your sin is purged by the hot coals. Jesus, God declares our sins are purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. But you see, for that to happen, we got to confess, God, my mouth has been messed up because my heart has not been right. I need a purging. I need a cleansing, God. David said over Psalm 51, after he, he had to confess about his sin with Bathsheba, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. So there's, a, there's things that need to happen on the inside. We need to confess our sin. Part of this time of this disconnect so we can get to reconnect is we need to come clean with God. God, I walked out of your will. God, I walked out of your way. There's stuff now I'm disconnected from because you had to disconnect me from those things because those things had me walking in the wrong way. God, now I'm looking up to you. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me by the blood of Jesus. God, make me right in your sight by the blood of Jesus. Because when you confess, God will cleanse you now. Let me let me slow down here. Let, let me slow down here. Uh, understand what understand what confession of sin does with God. Understand what confession of sin does with God. Confession of sin is about restoring our fellowship. Okay? If you're a child of God, when you sin, the relationship is not broken. The, the fellowship, we're not in fellowship with him. We, we partake in darkness, and when we partake in darkness, we're not in fellowship with God. So the confession of sin is about the fellowship with God, not the relationship with God. When, 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 uh, when my children, uh, when your children, my children, when they, were, when they were, did whatever they do, um, uh, when they disobeyed, they, they broke fellowship. They, they're still my child but they were out of fellowship with me. And so we had to do some whatever to help them get back in fellowship. Anyway, okay, let me leave it alone. Anyway, when we sin, we're still his child, but the fellowship is broken. So we need to confess our sin. Listen to this. So that our fellowship is restored, 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 restored. Okay. So listen now, listen, 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 listen. So, uh, in this time of, 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 of disconnect to reconnect, we, we need to get reconnected to God, okay? Um, we, we, we need to look up, we need to look up, we need to look up and see God in His holiness so we can worship Him. We need to spend some time now worshiping God. I, I, boy, I, 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 can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Even with my own life, this is time given us to worship Him, okay? So we need to worship him. We need to worship him. We, we, we need to understand that it's important to him. We need to confess our sin. We need to confess our sin. It's important in worship. Um, we confess our sin. As a matter of fact, put a, put a comma right there. Write this down. 
Write this down. This just came back to me. Write this down. You can come back to this later. Write down Jeremiah chapter 7. Write down Jeremiah chapter 7. Go back and read Jeremiah 7. I believe it's verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11. Jeremiah chapter 7. And see what, Jer what God says through Jeremiah about their sin and worshiping him. Let me give you the short version. God says, because you have sinned, I will not receive your worship. I just gave you the whole, I just gave it to you, you know, cliff notes. But you go back and read that. God's sin is so serious in God's sight, even with his people, that when they were sinning during the week, they came to worship him on the Sabbath, which would have been Saturday for them. And God says, I don't want to hear all this because I've seen how you've lived during the week. That's how serious it is, your life. Jesus said that we worship him in spirit and truth. Truth has to be, truth is according to God's word, out of your spirit. So, so this thing of confession is so important. But let me, let me, uh, let me get where I want to be here. Let me get where I'll be here. Um, um, so verse six, um, angel comes, the seraphim comes down, he cleanses his mouth, he cleans him, it, 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 his sin is purged, we confess our sin, uh, Jesus will forgive us of our sin. Then I want to get to verse eight, because this is what I want you to catch, in verse eight, this is what I want you to catch here, okay, verse eight. Uh, once we reconnect with God, the reconnect, listen to this, once we reconnect with God, now we can be used by him. Okay. Now we can be used by him through the reconnection in worship, through the reconnection and, and our confession of sin and him cleansing us of our sin. Listen to this. Now we can be used by him. Listen to this. Verse 8. Reconnect to God. We can be used by him. Listen to this. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, <laughs> send me. Wow, look at this, listen to this. Now that Isaiah has seen God, got the right vision of God, he's seen himself, and God has cleansed him from a sin, now he hears a voice saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah's response was, here I am, send me. Listen, listen. Why is this so important for us to get our reconnect to God right? It's because God wants to use us. Listen, in the context, I didn't read any further down. But in the context, God was going to send Isaiah to Judah, to Israel, to his people. He was going to send Isaiah to be a witness to his people. Listen, for us, why do we need to get this reconnect right? Because God wants to send us to people that don't know him. God wants to use us to draw people to him that don't know him by the way he uses us, okay? So why is the worship important? Because it's about recognizing who God is. It's about acknowledging that. Why is the confession of sin is important? Because God wants to use us as a vessel that he is, if you would, fit for his glory. Okay, so in this, this time of disconnect, God wants to make a reconnect. Now watch, in the reconnect, getting connected to God, that means we are usable by God. We're usable by God. See, when we're in sin, God can't use us. When we're ignoring God, God can't use us. So those other issues that we talked about before are, are issues that we need to take before God and do before God so God can use us. God, listen, in the reconnect, God can use you in your home. In the reconnect, if you're working right now, if you got to go back to work right now, God can use you on your job. In the reconnect, when you go somewhere because there's a need, not just a want, but when you go somewhere in a need situation, because there's something that you need to take care of, God can use you in that situation. You're going to get the need taken care of, but if you're going in God, God can use you, get your need taken care of, and God can use you to be a witness to somebody. And when this thing is over, when we go back to... Uh, whatever ever, uh, form of normal we can get to, there's a world out there that still needs to know Jesus saves. There's people out there still knows that need to know that Jesus is the answer. And when we get 
We connected to God. Listen, God will use us to his glory. You can tell them your story, but your story will be about his glory. So during this time, God is getting you ready. Girl, during this time, God is getting me ready for a greater call and being a witness for him. But we got to make sure that we use this time wisely. So when we go back, it just ain't business as usual. We go back, we didn't worshiped him. We didn't adored him. We didn't lifted him up. We go back. We have confessed our sin. We go back and God then forgave us of our sin. And now God says, who shall I send? Who go for us? And you can say, God send me. I'll say, God send me wherever I am. I'll live a life that will worship you. I'll live a life that will put you on display. God use my life to draw somebody to you. That's what this thing is all about. Disconnect from stuff so we can reconnect with God so God can get us ready for the work he's calling us to do. That's what this thing is all about. So no, it's not like the man said about half his life was gone. Half your life is not gone. There's some things you can't do right now that you want to do. You can't do right now, but you got to find true life in God in Jesus Christ. It's not that half your life is gone. God has removed some stuff out of your life so God can do some stuff with your life so he can move through your life so he can help somebody else in life. That's what God wants to do. So God will say, who can I send and who will go for me? And you and I can say, here I am, God. Here I am, send me. I'll be a witness. I'll testify of your goodness and your mercy. Use my lips, use my heart for the right cause, God, that you might, that you might be glorified in this time. During the disconnect, God wants to make a reconnect so he gets you ready to use you, so he can get you ready for him to use you for his glory. Bless God. We hope something was said to encourage you tonight. We bless God for being so good and so kind. If you would, just bow with me in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for your word tonight. Help us to recognize God from this time of disconnect from a lot of things that we're used to doing. God, you want to use this time for us to get reconnected to you repurposed in you, God, that we would we are refocusing from the, from the horizontal, God, to the vertical, that our eyes will get off of things and other stuff, God, and our eyes will get back on you. And we'll worship you, God, because you are holy, holy, holy. We will, we will exalt you, God. We will, we, will, we will magnify you, God, and that we will confess our sin. God, we talked about the lips tonight, but there's other things that we need to confess. And you said you'd be faithful to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we could be like Isaiah. <laughs> when you're looking for somebody to go, we'll say, God, here am I, send me. We'll be your witness. We'll tell us of your goodness and your mercy. Bless you tonight for your strength. Bless you tonight, God, for your peace. Bless you tonight, God, that we always have hope in you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you.